Okay, time to start again. So I will now talk a little bit out about something um, which is highly relevant for assignment one. So uh, it's an exercise in coding up a specific domain. So this course is not about set theory or pure set theory, but this is, as we have in other cases, used examples from mathematics. This is also a, an example from mathematical logic. So uh, just as we can code up complex numbers, we can code up uh, pure set theory. And here I will uh, give a little bit of the intuition and the possible syntax for parts of this. So I'm here trying to describe a set M. Uh, I hope you can see, uh, uh, by the way, a jam board where it says pure set theory up in the left. Otherwise, shout in the chat. Um, so the data type M uh, here has four constructors, uh, at least four visible on this screen. So empty is intended to be syntax for the empty set, usually written as a zero with a slash on it or as starting ending brace. So it's the empty set. And I've tried to use colors here to match the green circle around this one with the green circle around empty, the constructor. And as we've talked about sometimes before, I, I keep the syntax on the left here and the semantics on the right. So this is just a syntax tree data type empty sing union intersection but i don't have the energy to write out intersection so it's just intersect they are operators like addition multiplication whatever um, so union and intersection take two syntax trees and create a, a final syntax tree sing for singleton set takes just one and empty is the only leaf of this data type so um, there are layers and layers and layers upon operations like intersection and singleton and union. In the end, we end up with empty. So I need to stress here that there is no such thing as an element in these sets other than themselves. So it's not a set of natural numbers, a set of booleans, a set of anything. So M is just an abstract syntax data type for sets. So abs, syn, oops, this is now ugly, for sets. Incredibly ugly. I need to rewrite the syntax part there. Abstract syntax. OK, slightly better. I'm not good at writing on the <laughs> tablet, you can see. Good at that. Prepared some things and written with a little more care. So the four constructors here, I'm trying to illustrate on the right uh, with the notation usually used in mathematics. So uh, the singleton, so that's start brace, X, end brace is a singleton set of one thing X. So uh, it's supposed to be a one element set containing just X, whatever X is. So X could be the empty set, and notice that's not the same as an empty set. So a singleton set containing an empty set is something else than just an empty set. For one thing, it has one element instead of this one, which has zero elements. Uh, and then usually union is this symbol and intersection is this symbol uh, on the semantic side. So useful functions uh, are cardinality, so for any set, we can compute the number of elements in the set. So this wouldn't work if we had also infinite sets. But here we only focus on finite sets to start with, which means we can assign a natural number, which is the number of elements in the set. Uh, that's one of the sort of um, test functions we can implement. Another relevant thing, which is part of the assignment, is to implement another syntax for properties about sets. And one of the properties is LM. So LM is usually written in fix on the right hand side here. You've got the little epsilon used. 
And the meaning here, if you look on the, on the left again, is it compares two elements, two, two um, set expressions, one on the left, one on the right, for example, x and singleton x. And then it should be true or false, depending on if that element is actually in the set or not. So um, examples uh, of, of things you might want to check here is that the cardinality of the empty set is zero. And now this is perhaps confusing, but the usual mathematics syntax for card is a bar before and after. X is inside the braces and X is outside is not the same. Yes, it is the same. So this is the same X and as that X. So this claim, for example, is always true. X is an element of the set of one element, which is X. So X is the only such element, but at least we know that if you make if you take an X and you make a single set out of it, then X is in it. So why is LM M to M to prop? Well, X has to type M and X also has to type M. I mean, the, the, the expression here, if I would write it out, would be LM X sing X. That would be of type prop. So X and singleton X uh, are both of the same type. So both are expressions in the pure set theory. Does LM work recursively? Does it answer is this element in the set or is this element an element in any of the subsets of these sets? No, it does not work recursively. It's just, is this an element of the set? So um, this one is true, but if X internally would have some structure, uh, it will not look further. It just checks if it's an element of the set. Okay, and some, some other sanity checks. The, the cardinality, oh, well, now I'm circling things with a pen instead of just marking. So this one was one sanity check. Another thing is that the singleton set should always have exactly one element. And this is related to the question, should it recursively go down? So cardinality does not recursively go down into the structure. It just checks how many elements are there in this set? Because for example, X here could also be a singleton set. Or it could be a two element set or a five element set. But still the singleton set containing X has cardinality exactly one. Another check is that if we take the union of two sets and then we check the cardinality, that should be at least the cardinality of one of the sets. Because we could have added some elements in B if they were different from A, and in that case, it would be greater. So a set containing an infinite set still has cardinality one, yes. If X is an infinite set or if X is a finite set does not matter. The singleton set, always has cardinality one. Good questions. Okay, let's move to the next slide or Jamboard page. This is maybe a bit cluttered, but I'm trying here to illustrate uh, a bit of the logic connection. So I am have this arrow connecting the LM on the left hand side and the use of LM in three places on the right hand side. So just to show what do we know or what, what should hold for LM. So an X, a value should be an element of the union of A and B. If and only if it's the element of A or it's the element of B. So here we can sort of translate between uh, one expression and a more sort of, we've pushed down the LM one step and using OR in between. And then that way we could sort of step-by-step step try to in, in infer what the value should be here. Similarly, when is X an element of the intersection of A and B? Well, when it's both a member of A and a member of B. 
So this is the and, and this is the or. Um, as an illustration here, um, if I want to be very, very concrete, let's make A the set of one and two, and B the set of two, three, and four. And then compute a few example sets from these. So I haven't introduced the operator set minus, but from mathematics, we know that there exists such an operator. It means you're in A, but you're not in B. It's a good exercise to write out the logic uh, corresponding to it. But here is now just the exercise. OK, what is this set? What should be the right hand side here? So I don't mean to say it's the empty set. Yeah, OK, so in that box, there should be a one. So all the elements which are in A, but not in B, is just the singleton set one. OK, similarly, what should be in between the braces on the right? OK, somebody says three and four. Yes. So the little b, the capital B minus the capital A, is the set three, four. OK, so that means that one way of describing A is as a union of little a, uh, which is the elements which are in a but not in b, and the elements in i. Now I defined i here to be the elements which are in both a and b. And similarly, b is the union of the unique elements in b and the elements which are in both. And it, as a matter of fact, these unions, these examples here, are actually disjoint unions. So notice that there is no element in A which is also in I. And there is no element in B which is also in I. So if I want to count the elements with the cardinality, this might be useful. So why I'm typing this? Yes, because I want to, I want to end up with a, a useful law about intersection and union and so on. So the question is, if I have the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B, how is that related to, OK, I shouldn't write equal here. I, sh I should try to find out how that relates to the sum function of the cardinality of A union B. Oh, that should not be. It. And A in, sorry, intersection B. How are these three numbers related? The sum of the um, ele number of elements in A and B and the number of elements in A union B and the number of elements in A intersection B. So at least we can check for this particular case, the number of elements in A is two. The number of elements in B is three. The number of elements in the union is one, two, three, four. And the number of elements in the intersection is one. So there is a suggestion here that A plus B, the cardinality of A plus cardinality B is equal to the cardinality of A union B minus the cardinality of A intersection B. Uh -huh, okay, the, the N is a simulation of the intersection symbol there. But that doesn't sound right according to this mathematics here. Because we can see that um, 2 plus 3 is 5, and 4 minus 1 is only 3. So um, not quite. So there are some suggestions above in the chat as well, but I want a, 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 an exact, I would see if we, I mean, for, for this particular example, it's clear that 2 plus 3 is equal to 4 plus 1. But is it always the case? And can we argue for why it should always be the case? Well, I can, I can at least say that in this particular case, we know this because we know that four plus one is five. 
But why should it be so? It has to do with either A, B from the exercises. Well, you, you can say that. So, so the thing is that notice when we add up the elements of A and B, we count I twice. So we count all the elements in A, including the intersection. And then we count all the elements in B, including the intersection again. So the two plus three here is actually the, the unique elements of A and B. That's one and two, that's three together, plus two times the number of elements in the intersection. And here on the right-hand side, when we do the union, of A and B, one element sort of disappears because we've got two copies of two and sets do not contain duplicates. So even though this had two elements and this had three elements, there would be five elements in total. As two of them were the same, we ended up with only four in the union. But here we had five because we counted sort of badly <laughs> in some way you could say. And that's exactly the difference is exactly this one the intersection, that, that's I, or the cardinality of I. Anyway, we don't have to dig into the, the details of this, but it, it's good exercise to think about that actually this, um, when you take the union, you sort of lose, potentially lose some elements, and but you know exactly which those are, and those are the ones in the intersection. So that's why you get this, uh, this law. Uh, this, this law is not part of the assignment, but I'm trying to do things with sets, which will get you a little bit used to pure set theory. Okay, now a little, a few words about unions. So I got the union U up here, and it's supposed to be like a multiplication table, but for, for the union, and it might see some, some traces of symbols that I've been, <laughs> I had this filled in and then I erased it again. Um, so first, uh, it's supposed to fill in uh, the result of uh, unifying or taking the union of the, uh, the argument on the left and the argument on the right. But I haven't yet defined what these things are. But before I define them, let's just say that this, uh, this is names of different sets. And I want to com compute a table of all the results of unifying these using also the same names. And then I can simplify the problem before even starting by noting this relation up on the right. The union of X and Y is the same as the union of Y and X. So the order doesn't matter in sets. And for this table, it means that whatever value I fill in in this box on the left high, below the diagonal, should also be copied up to this box. So let's, let's even uh, make a little blue arrow there. So there is, a, there is a correspondence between this box and that box, between this box and this box, and so on. So if I've computed uh, x union y, I don't need to also compute u, a, y union x. And that's the fact that union is commutative. So that's the blue text on the left here. This is saying that union is commutative. And I encourage you to implement some checks when you're doing your labs to make sure that your union is actually also uh, commutative. OK, so the other rule, uh, the red little snake in the middle here, that's checking what happens if you take, let's write it in red here, if you take x union x. Yeah, so x union x is x. Whatever set you start with, if you take a union with itself, well, everything will be duplicate. And as duplicates are not included, that means that whatever I put there should be just the same as I had. And this means I can actually fill in whatever m0 is defined to be, uh, the result here in the, on the diagonal should be m0, m1, m2, t0, 1, m3, and so on, forever. 
Okay, so that means that more than half of this table is already filled in. So let's see if we can fill in uh, a little more. Um, so the third thing I want to do, which is also a general uh, property, that's filling in the first column. But then I, for do that, I need to define M0. So I will define M0 to be empty. Well, sorry, uh, difficult to write here. I mean, the empty set, which I now, this is incredibly difficult today, empty, which I will also, here I will use the same notation. I will mix syntax and semantics because I want to fit the figure over there. So I, I will also write it just as the, the empty set. So what happens if I take the union of the empty set with any other set? So what is x union m0? Yeah, x. So union with the empty set is the identity function. So the empty set acts as a zero of addition. So zero, uh, so x plus zero, so I can write it in the comment here, x plus zero equals x. That's a similar rule. So it's, it's a zero of addition, or it's a zero of union, the M zero. Well, that means that we can already fill in the first column completely. So it's M one, M two, T zero one, M three, any X, whatever. Okay. So now we don't have too many boxes left. So let's define M1, or let's do it this, this way. So MI plus one is the singleton set of MI. So concretely, it means that M1 is the singleton set containing M0, which is also then the singleton set containing the empty set. Does the set expand into the set or do we get a set of sets? So this is a set of sets, you could say. I mean, actually, pure set theory, all the sets are sets of sets, of sets, of sets, of sets. It, it just sets all the way down. There is nothing else than sets in pure set theory. So it's a very untyped setting or unityped, you could say. There is only one thing. Everything is a set. They're very annoying for a Haskell programmer. Anyway, this is not a set of, of Booleans or a set of characters, something like that. It's just a set of abstracts, pure sets. Anyway, M1, we know, is not equal to M0. Because this is a singleton set, so it is a one element set. It's not a zero element set, so they are not equal. So it's a one element set containing a zero element set. Okay, and, and similarly, of course, then M2 is the singleton set of M1. So it's a set of one element, but it's not different. It's not the same as M1. And it's not the same as M0. So we have, we have actually every MI here is different. And the first one has size zero and all the others, oh, cardinality zero, and all the others have cardinality one. Okay, so we can get infinitely many sets in this way, but they are all a little bit boring because they all contain exactly one element. But now at least we have the names M0, M1, and M2. So we can, we can actually fill, it, fill in the next box, or we can try to fill in the next box. And uh, let's see if we can compute it. So the next box is supposed to be the union, whoops, uh, the union of M1 and M2. So I, I write M1 union M2, but it's the same as M2 union M1. Okay, so it's the union of the singleton set of M0 with the singleton set of M1. I just expanded the definitions. 
And now if we have two sets with one element each, and those two elements are different, then we have this usual notation, start bra brace, and then a list of elements, in this case, M0 and M1, and then end brace. So this now is actually something more interesting. It's a two element set. The cardinality of this set is two. Let's call it T01. So we've finally got to an element which is not just zero or one. Uh, we've got to a set which is not just zero or one element. It actually has two different elements, M0 and M1. And as you can imagine, it's, well, I wouldn't say a lot of fun. Perhaps you don't think this is fun, but it's very useful uh, to fill in the rest of the table to try to define by, by a sort of uh, symmetry T1, 2, or, or T1, 3, or T0, 1, 2, so a three element set, and so on. Um, so it's good practice, but it's also useful to check if you got the semantics right in your lab. Because if you just test it on the empty set, that is not going to be very much confidence in the correctness of it. But if you start testing it on, on several different sets of different cardinalities, then it's much more likely that you will get a good test suite. OK, let's see if I had anything on the eighth. No, not really. OK, what does the notation TIJ mean? Well, it's not obvious, of course. Uh, I just noticed here over on the right, let's make it a little more clear, that I have, um, I have a two element set with M0 and M1. And I got a zero and a one there as names. So I mean with the T, I, J, I mean the two element set M, I, M, J. Well, actually it's a two element set only if I and J are different. If I and J is the same, it's a one element set. Um, but that's what I mean with, with the T, I, J notation. And it, it's, it, this is not some notation anybody else uses. I just tried to make up some notation which is short enough to write on the slide. Uh, but it's, it's just uh, what I'm trying to instill in you is the desire to, uh, to have at least five or six different sets with different cardinalities around for doing your testing. Because otherwise, um, it would be like writing a program for, for reversing list and then testing, does it reverse the empty list? Does it reverse the one element list? Okay, it probably does correct every time. While the, the empty list and the, and the one element list are sort of trivially correct, they are already reversed, but everything else is more interesting. Okay, uh, now I will uh, swap over to doing some live coding. So I will stop and start the recording.